Hi, uh, good afternoon. So uh, my name is Gavin Reardon. I'm a judge of the Massachusetts Superior Court. Um, I'm here to kind of talk about whatever it is you want to talk about. Um, there aren't any questions that are out of bounds. Uh, there are probably answers that out of, are out of bounds, and, and I won't give them to you if they're out of bounds. But you should feel free to um, ask me anything you want. I don't really know what your interest is. Um, I'm just going to read off a little blurb about what the Superior Court is, because you may not all know that. Um, it's just get, good to get that groundwork out there. Uh, so the Superior Court has original jurisdiction of civil actions over $50,000. So what does that mean practically? Superior Court is a court of general jurisdiction. It's the highest trial court in Massachusetts. So generally on civil cases, those are cases that are about money damages. Those are breaches of contract, real estate questions, car accidents, medical malpractice, wrongful death. So we generally only have cases where the expected jury award, if there's going to be one or, or finding, is $50,000 or more. The smaller cases go to the district court. Um, and we have equitable relief. Uh, we have a business litigation section, which is in Boston, uh, where some of the more complicated business litigation is generally heard. It can be heard in Worcester or Springfield or anybody else, but anywhere else, but we have a specialized court for that. And we have jurisdiction over all, almost all criminal cases, but we generally only hear felonies, which are cases that have a, a possibility of conviction to a state prison sentence instead of a house of correction sentence. Typically, we hear murder cases, rape cases, child rape cases, arsony, robbery, armed robbery while masked, things of that nature. Um, I did a murder case last month. I have another one coming up next week. So we hear generally the more serious um, criminal cases and the bigger civil cases. Um, we have exclusive jurisdiction over first-degree murder cases. So that's generally what we do. We can hear almost anything. I don't think we can do divorces anymore. We used to back in the day. Those are pretty much just in probate court now. I think that's been taken away from us, although there's still a possibility. We never hear them. They all go to probate court. But generally, almost any case you can bring in Massachusetts, you can bring in the Superior Court. If it's not of a certain uh, size or complexity, it may get sent back out to the district court. Just a little bit about the history of the Massachusetts court system, because I think it's always important to, to think about that. We have a very long and, for the most part, proud history here. Um, I was a lawyer for over 30 years. My father was a lawyer. I have three sisters who were lawyers. Um, I have a brother who's a lawyer, and I have some, relatives, some uh, siblings who are not lawyers. So I'm actually very invested in the Massachusetts legal system. Um, our, our Supreme Judicial Court was founded in 1692. Um, it is the oldest continuously functioning appellate court in the Western Hemisphere. So that's how far back our court system goes. The first jury trial in the United States was held in 1630 in Plymouth, Massachusetts. It involved people coming over from the Mayflower. So that's how far back our judicial and court system goes. Our state constitution is from 1780. The United States Constitution is from 1789. Our state constitution is the template for the United States Constitution. So just a few things about sort of our history, and uh, I'm proud to be part of that history. So I don't know what questions you might have about the court system. I'd rather kind of answer questions or inquiries than just sort of hold forth about it. Um, I don't know what the current topics are or, or what interest you might have. Does anybody have any kind of question? <laughs> so how do you go from being a lawyer to a Superior Court judge? There must be a process of it. Yeah, it's a rather lengthy process. Um, so you have to apply to the Judicial Nominating Commission. Um, that's a division of the governor's office. And they've set it up. You go through a lengthy process. You have to fill out, I don't know, probably a 25-page application. There are two parts, so it's probably actually 40 pages. <laughs> Um, you have to have been a lawyer for, I think, 15 years before you can apply. Um, and then you get interviewed. You go to, a, I've been through this, obviously, so it's a, a, a long room. Usually it's in Boston in one of the big uh, law firms, and it's at night. And you sit around the table with about as many people as you are here, and they ask you questions. That's assuming you get through that cut. 
Most people don't get through that first time. Based on your resume and what you're submitting, um, they're not even going to give you an interview. So if you get to an interview, then you have to get through that and you have to be recommended to be investigated by the governor. And the governor's office does what they call a due diligence investigation of you, where they talk to your peers, they look at your history, they find out if there's anything in your closet. And then if, you're, if, you do, if you get through that, then they recommend you to the Joint Bar Committee, which does another due diligence investigation of you and determines if you make it through that. If you make it through that, you get to the Governor's Council, which you probably heard about a little bit, and that's seven elected officials who then go to another interview with them. And if they recommend you, then you're finally, they finally approve you. They have to approve you. Approve you. It's seven people, so you have to get at least four members to approve you. I think it's eight, actually. You have to get a majority of that. And then if you make it through all that, then you're sworn in as a judge. Um, and what they're often looking for um, are your qualifications. Um, what kind of history do you have? And what kind of trial experience do you have? Um, that's important. Uh, unfortunately, we're getting fewer trial attorneys all the time. Um, it's just the nature of the world. Uh, just like there are fewer in-person things with doctors and things are done, you know, online. Um, we're not having as many trials as we used to, and because of that, we're not having as many trial attorneys as we used to. So it's kind of like having fewer surgeons around. We're just not really growing them. Um, my pers I was a trial attorney for a long time. I think that makes a big difference when you're actually doing trial work. I mean, we have appellate judges who haven't done trials. Many judges on an appeals court may never been a trial attorney. So if you're a trial attorney, that can be a little frustrating because you feel like somebody's judging you who hasn't done what you've done. I'm not criticizing them. I know I'm being recorded, so I'm definitely not criticizing the appeals court. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's a different world. I'm trying to make decisions on the fly, and they're trying to make academic decisions. That's important because my decision made on the fly may not comport with some hypothetical or some, something that they've thought of. Um, but I think it's important to have people um, in the system. Um, I was, among other things, more years ago than I want to think about, I was the co-founder of the Law Office Technology Division of the Worcester County Bar Association, which is a long way of saying that I got on the internet when you have to dial into it. And we used to show demonstrations to that to attorneys who weren't yet on the internet. And then we started networking computers and saying, you can actually talk to your secretary and you don't have to walk down the hall and say, here. <laughs> and that was really cool. So people have tended to ask me, don't you think the internet and remote uh, processes can help with the court system? And I always like, well, to a point. You know, to a point. But where are the people business? You know, I want to see somebody. I'm trying to gauge their credibility. I'm trying to understand what's on their mind. If it's a jury, they should see somebody. Because there's a lot of body language and there's, you know, tone um, that make a difference. Uh, I think it's also important in the world that you get to be heard. And you should be able to be heard in person. Um, you shouldn't have to be heard on the telephone or by a video because, you know, I'm sentencing people. I mean, I, I'm sending people to jail. I'm not sending them all to jail. I don't really want to send them to jail, but I'm sending them to jail. If I'm sending somebody to jail, I should be sending a person to jail. I should not be sending a video to jail. I should not be sending a television screen to jail. I should not be losing that personal connection because that's important. If somebody has lost a job because of some uh, discrimination or unfairness, that person should have the opportunity to come in and tell other people about what he or she experienced in person. Um, especially with the pandemic that we had for like two years, we were doing a lot of things remotely. Um, we kind of had to do them remotely because we had to function. So there's now sort of a question going forward of how much can we do remotely now? How much should we do remotely now? There are questions of access to the court system. Um, I mean, you live out here in the wilds of Douglas, right? Um, I used to live in the wilds of Mendon. Right? So I, I, I know where Douglas is. I've been in Douglas. But it may be hard for some of you to get to a court here. You're, you're taking time out from your day. We have people with disability issues. Um, we have people with language issues. We have people with, it's, it's difficult for them to get there. They may not have a car. So we're trying to weigh, you know, those things. And we're, we're trying to be fair to people without losing some of what I'm talking about. Um, so for instance, before the pandemic hit, you had 12-person 
civil trials in the Superior Court. You had 12 jurors. That's not a constitutional requirement, that's just a rule of court. Um, in federal court, they've done eight. In district court, they do six jurors. So the SJC, the Supreme Judicial Court, said it's very hard for us to get jurors right now. It's only going to require um, six people in, in Superior Court, civil trials now, not 12. So now we've been doing trials with eight jurors. We usually impanel a couple of extra ones in case somebody gets sick or has a problem in the middle of the trial. That's helping us to catch up on the backlog of cases. That very well may be the rule going forward because maybe we've learned that we don't really need 12. And it's hard to get people into the courthouse. But, you know, we're contending with sort of the balancing of these systems. Um, and I don't know where it's going to go going forward. I mean, I'm, I'm in favor of more people coming to court, but I know it's hard. Um, on the criminal side, I think it's absolutely important that people keep coming to court. I think that's where you really lose it. And there are constitutional issues. I mean, I'm sure you've all heard about the right to confrontation. I get to see my accuser face to face. That's very important. And we haven't gone so far as to say you can do um, a criminal trial by video. There have been some decisions that say some of the lesser or the pretrial parts of a criminal case you might be able to do by video. I'm not really in favor of that either, but if there's a really good reason for it, um, we might do it. Because, again, you know, we have an obligation to, to move cases. Um, not to move a product, not like it's a box or something coming from Amazon. But, you know, with the, with the pandemic, a lot of our cases got delayed. So we have cases now that are three or four years old. Um, and that's a problem. It's a problem if you're waiting to find out if you're going to get compensated for your claim. It's a problem if you've been sitting in jail and maybe you're not guilty. Yeah. It's a problem if you're wearing an ankle bracelet because you have a GPS and we want to know where you are. We can't get your case tried. So we're trying to do some things to, to take advantage of modern technology, which is good in some ways. We have to be careful about um, streamlining. So that was a long answer to how you get appointed as a judge. <laughs> When, when you're appointed, are you appointed for life? I'm appointed until age seven. Okay. okay. So Massachusetts judges are appointed. We're one of only, I don't know, we're a small minority of cases, we're a small minority of states where judges are appointed. Five, maybe fewer than ten. Um, that was John Adams who decided that judges should be appointed, I think because he'd had experience with the British system where things were just imposed on you. Uh -huh. Um, I'm personally very strongly in favor of that. Um, most states, judges are elected. I just think that's a really, really bad idea. Um, we have to make unpopular decisions. Some of them we know they're unpopular when we make them, but we still make them. Some of them we don't know that they're going to be unpopular. Um, but I, I can't be thinking if I make this decision, I won't be reelected, and then maybe I closed out my law business, and what am I going to do? I shouldn't be subjected to that pressure. Um, but we have mandatory retirement at age 70, um, which I think makes sense. Um, some of my colleagues, so there are 82 Superior Court judges across the state when, when all of the positions are filled. And obviously it's rotating, people are hitting mandatory retirement and people are leaving for a variety of reasons. Um, about half of them, when they get to 70, they're ready, they're done. <laughs> about half of them feel good and they still want to keep going. Uh, but they can't. And I think that's a, a pretty good cutoff. Um, I mean, I think you can still do it, but we all age differently. And the other thing is, um, you know, you can get worn out. Um, you, you do make a lot of decisions. So when I go home, this is going to be, this is going to be in trouble because it's on the record, but I've said it before anyway. <laughs> so when I get home, it's usually like, what do you want to eat? And I'm like, I don't want to make a decision about what I want to eat. I, I just made a whole bunch of decisions. I sent this guy to jail. I dismissed that case. I gave that guy a trial. And this guy came in and argued about bail. So I don't want to. I'm happy with But what does that really mean? It means I'll, you, you make the decision. Um, on a more serious note, though, you do, it, it does wear on you sometimes even when you're not aware of it. So, you know, we have vacation time. Um, I have a good... I'm technically entitled to 30 vacation days a year. When I was in private practice, I took about five because, you know, I was a small, was a small family-run law firm, and then I was a solo practitioner. So I just answered the phone all day long. And I answered the phone on weekends because nothing criminal or dangerous or significant happens on weekends when people are out drinking and arguing and fighting. Um, 
But almost none of us take that time because the job's important, we have work to do, and we don't want to be away that long. But occasionally it's good to say, I'm just going to take a day off. Because, you know, maybe, I've, uh, maybe I'm getting a little short-tempered. Maybe I'm getting a little worn out. Um, Superior Court, court officers know this. Oh, and I don't think I said, oh, did I say hello to Mike Riley and Joe Calora, the court officers were here? So they may sing up if they haven't answered anything, but I think they won't. <laughs> but, you know, they're here. We're, we're very lucky to have them. They escort all the detainees and the prisoners. And we're not actually allowed to be in um, a courtroom without a court officer, just because we never know if somebody's going to misbehave. It, it's rare, but they do happen because people are... I don't think any of you people can do that. Um, but it does happen. Uh, so yeah, you know, we're just we're, we're always trying to deliver the best service we can um, within the bounds of the system. Like I said, I was an attorney for a long time. I mostly represented um, individual clients. I mostly represented people. Um, I did some. I represented some corporations. I. Uh, <coughs> I defended the MBTA in accident cases that had wrongful death and train accidents. Not doing that anymore. I'll be very busy. Um, I defended the Catholic Diocese of Worcester for about two decades on pre-sex offense cases. Um, so I've seen a lot of individual people who've had a lot of suffering and difficulty, which is why I'm a big proponent of getting people into court. Right? Because there's a lot of bad news to be out there. People should get it face to face, or they should have their chance to um, should have their chance to to fight for it at least. Um, the other thing is, you know, it's expensive and time consuming to go to court. Uh, we wish it weren't. Um, it's not particularly for us. I mean, I think it costs two hundred and seventy five dollars to file a civil suit. That's about what it costs you to get a trial in the court system. Now, that's not counting the lawyers and the you know all the other things and and. They do depositions and discovery, and that makes it expensive. So a lot of people go to mediation or arbitration, which are you know private systems where you hire a lawyer to either mediate, which means he tries to get you to come to an agreement, or you arbitrate, which means that lawyer acts like a judge. He hears the evidence, or she hears the evidence, and makes a decision. I mean, people are using that a lot more. Um, unfortunately, I think because the court system takes a while and because it's expensive. Uh, but we want you to feel able to come to court. We want you to, you know, come see us and have your case adjudicated before us. Um, and I think we're going to catch up um, as long as the pandemic doesn't hit again. I don't know if it's going to happen in September with BA 5, 6, 7, wherever we are. Um, we did hold trials during the pandemic. We cut them off for about... We cut them off about 18 months or something, I think. So we didn't do any for about 18 months. Then we were actually doing it for about six months. People had masks. Um, and it was very impressive because uh, the people who came in to serve on service jurors with masks, fewer of them, in my opinion, um, had an excuse or were washed out than before that. So the people who self selected or agreed to come into the court even during the pandemic and were wearing masks. We we're holding trials with everyone wearing masks. Most of them ended up being impaneled. I would say a smaller percentage of them washed out than before. Um, and then we loosened the restrictions. So now um, people do come. That you're free to wear a mask if you want. Uh, my impression is only about 10 or 15 percent of the people in the courthouse right now are wearing masks, and that pers that's a personal decision. Uh, we didn't have a lot of COVID problems uh, during the pandemic. About, you know, I don't know, once a week or something, we, we'd hear about an exposure somewhere. We actually had a couple of jurors, I think, that were worried they were COVID positive during a trial, or um, you know, somebody in their family had been exposed. Um, and we would bring the other jurors in and say, we have this information, are you still willing to sit? And they said, yes, you know, I'm still willing to sit. I'm invested in a trial and I'm going to see it through. So, um, you know, it's largely been impressive and a little bit uplifting how well people have done with, dealt with the pandemic in the court system. Uh, any other questions? Does your court handle cases about conservatorships? 
I don't think we handle cases about conservatorships. That's a probate court matter. And I haven't done a conservatorship. Um, the probate court does a lot of them. Um, and a conservatorship's a little different from a guardianship. I don't know if you know the, the difference. Maybe you do. Um, so conservatorship, for people who don't know, is, uh, that's a, an assertion by usually a family member or a caretaker that somebody isn't mentally capable of taking care of his or her finances, uh, but is capable of making normal life decisions and everything else. So you apply, and there's a competency determination, and then if the judge, usually it's a probate judge, agrees, um, then a conservator is appointed to manage the person's financial affairs. And then a guardianship is when somebody isn't able to manage really any affairs, not the activities that they were living, not the finances. So those are routinely given out um, in the probate court. Uh, I would say this, um, I'm not probably all that different in age from some of you, um, so I'd be a little younger than some of you, but I've certainly seen a lot of difficulty and misery with families at sort of end of life or, or, or when somebody's becoming incompetent mm -hmm. type of issues. Will contests and arguments. I'm not trying to push uh, business for lawyers, okay? But I will say this. All those issues about finances, wills, estates, trusts, conservatorships, guardianships, get a lawyer. Okay, because what happens if somebody comes to court and the person who, whose intentions we want to honor is now either incompetent or deceased. All right, if we don't have that properly documented and notarized, uh, it makes it very hard for us. And families get in tremendous disputes about this. There, there are a lot of hurts, there's a lot of arguments. They can get very um, aggressive and painful, um, even for me as a judge to watch it or observe it. Um, and the other thing a lawyer does is a lawyer is a witness to say, you know, a person came in, knew who the president was, knew what the day of the week was, knew what he or she wanted, made this change. I asked him, do you want to change that? No, I don't want to change that. Um, so, you know, we have strict rules about, about how you uh, notarize a will and how you witness a will. And the same with guardianships and conservatorships and living wills and all those sorts of things. I'm not a specialist in that. That isn't something that the Superior Court really sees. I had some tangential connection with it when I was a lawyer in private practice. Um, so I've seen it. I know people often want to save money, all right? Um, but, uh, you know, you have estates that are worth, I mean, even a modest, you know, estate could be worth six figures. Maybe worth very much more than that especially with the appreciation of property and other things that go on over the course of your life. So it's worth it to spend some money for a lawyer to draft up something routine. I don't do anything with Medicaid or Medicare trusts, okay? Um, but definitely go see a lawyer about any of that stuff because it's incredibly complicated and it changes all the time. It's like the tax code. The government's always making you know, new decisions about it every year. Every time they revise something, they may revise that. So um, you want to go see a lawyer so the lawyer will get it done right. You want to go see a lawyer so you'll have a witness to authenticate afterwards that you knew what you were doing. You want to have a lawyer so if anything goes wrong, you have somebody to make a complaint against. It. Because then you, you've, you've, you've had a professional do it. Um, any other questions? I'm sorry about my phone ringing. I, That's all right. I'm you know, very sorry about if that. If you were in court, they'd put you in the holding cell. <laughs> <laughs> I, I understand. No, um, it's fine. Don't worry about it. <laughs> um, I, I live on a private road. And, yeah. Okay. In in, in massive in this town, and it's uh, because it's a private road. It, it's very difficult to s sort out certain issues. Um, people say to me all the time, well, get a lawyer, get a lawyer, right. do this, do that. I've called many lawyers and they've said to me, well, you, for this type of situation that you have, you, you should probably think about mortgaging your property. Okay, um, that, that's outrageous. Okay, you mean that, so you can pay their fee? Yeah, yeah, because it's going to be such a contentious issue. Uh, okay, well, that's okay. unfortunate. But Okay, then I've talked to others that say, no, because it's a private road, um, 
you can't do this or that. Everyone does as they please. And so um, to get a lawyer to fight that aspect of it is also very difficult. That's also very costly. What would you advise? Well, so let me say, by way of disclaimer, I can't give you legal advice. No, but no. Because I'm a judge, so <laughs> yeah, I, right. I can't do that. Um, I also haven't done um, sort of a private road litigation in my career. I've done a lot of different things, but I haven't done that. Um, I hesitate to say, don't get a lawyer. One thought that comes to mind is, you probably can't do this, or you probably would have done it, to see if you can get the other people on the private road to agree to something. Um, but they'd have to put it in writing. The problem with things like that is that, um, and why lawyers may be saying it, it, it's not that simple, you know, you have deeds, um, you have meets and bounds, right. um, and those have to be um, registered in the registry of deeds, and people have to agree to them. Um, otherwise, it becomes very contentious. Mm -hmm. uh, we do have cases of what's called adverse possession, all right. So adverse possession is, you know, here's the boundary line, but somebody thinks the boundary line is over here. So there's a hedge over here, and I've been cutting this grass forever, and I've been using this for my parties, and I'm actually 50 feet onto your property. And the person says, well, and then for some reason, usually because they're selling the house or because they're deeding it to a, a family member or whatever, they get a survey done. It's like, wait a minute, this picnic table's on my property. And they say, we've been holding picnics there for 35 years. So if you use a person's property adversely on a claim of right for 20 years, you obtain possession of that property, right? You can also obtain an easement. Like I've been going for, I, I've walked down to the lake all the time. We've been, my generation's been going through that forever and ever to get to that lake. We've been using it for 15 years. You may, you may obtain by law a right to continue to use it. That's an easement. So it's not the kind of simple thing they can really agree to. And even if you did, you'd want to get in the writing and you want some surveyor to agree to what the property lines are. And, and then you'd want to either change the deeds or register it somehow in the registry of deeds. And I'm not exactly sure how you do that. Uh, um, so it's a little bit difficult. It's one of those things that you know we know in common sense where we want to get to. Um, but you know, in this country, almost all, especially in this state, almost all land is accounted for. It has to be accounted for by deed. Yes. And what the rights are has to be accounted for you know, by deed. And we write easements into deeds, or you obtain an adverse possession or an easement by a trial. We actually have trials about that. There was one going in Superior Court just last week. I wasn't doing it, um, but people are arguing about that. And, and that's why it gets expensive. So the lawyer could say, you can tell me what you want, but then I've got to get a hold of your neighbors and find out if your neighbors agree. And if they don't agree, then I've got to file some sort of litigation or whatever, and it just becomes difficult. Um, so I guess that's not probably the answer you want. No, but I, I had a feeling it would be like that. But, Thank but you. it is. Anyway. It's, it, it, yeah. it, it's not as simple as we like it to be. No, obviously. Thank you. Yeah. Anything else? Do you ever officiate cases where it's somebody's making a claim against the town or the town is making a claim against, let's say, a landowner over personal matters? Yes. Do they go to Superior yep. Court? An argument with the town is just like any other argument. Um, I know that there's, uh, one of my fellow judges was having an argument with the town of Brockton um, because they were doing some sort of trench and they cut the power cable to some kind of company while they were trenching. So the company has sued them, and the town of Brockton is arguing they shouldn't have to pay for whatever reason. Not my case. I don't know the details of it. Um, but yes, we have we have towns and municipalities as both plaintiffs and defendants pretty routinely. Um, there are some other issues with them sometimes with what we call torts, torts or civil accidents, broken legs, car accidents, um, damage to property, things like that. Um, I'm not going to get into all the details of that. Towns and municipalities have certain immunities and limitations on how much money you can get from them. And there's a, a certain procedure you have to go through to notify them before you can even file a suit. But provided you go through those steps, you can bring a suit against um, you know, a town or municipality. When I was a lawyer, we had a suit against, um, I don't remember what town it was actually, but it was a, a police officer. There was a fire 
and he was rushing to get to some pumping stations, and he hit a car and killed someone. So we represented the estate of those people, and that actually went to court. We prevailed, um, but we had to go through some of those various hoops. And the question was, was it such an emergency that he should have been, you know, rushing? And it's, it's you know, property burning with maybe nobody in it or maybe not, you know. And, and so, but the short answer is yes. You can bring a town to court or a municipality to court just like you bring anybody else with a few minor exceptions. Any other questions? If you could, if you could wave your magic wand and make a change, what would probably be at the top of your list? If I could make wave my magic wand and make a change to the court system, yeah. Um, I think going back to what I kind of said, um, I just wish it were easier for people to get into the system. Um, I think it's a very good system. Um, I analogize it to our medical system. Um, I think that our medical system is very good when you get something serious going on. I think when you're going to get a surgery or an operation or, or treatment for cancer or whatever, I think you get pretty good care. I'm not touching on insurance. That's <laughs> But I think the care you get from the surgeon, the care you get from nurses, and the technology, um, and the quality is pretty good. But what you have to go through to get there, in terms of waiting, and delays, and continuances, and finances, that's a problem. You know, and I, I, I think it's the same thing in the court system. I, I would like it if you could come in and file a claim, you know, pay your 275 or $300, whatever it is. I'm not saying that's nothing, but it's not huge. And you know, in six months or a year, without spending a whole bunch of money, you could get a decision. Um, I wish that if you were arrested today, you could have a trial, you know, certainly within a year, and you could get your answer. Um, takes a lot longer, um, and that's a problem. Um, some of it is, you know, legitimate. I mean, we now have so much um, scientific evidence which we didn't have. I mean, I'm old enough um, that I used to try cases with seven or eight pieces of paper. I mean, I could have a trial where there was armed robbery and they had two witness statements and an alleged confession from my client, and that all amounted to about eight type pages typed up by some police officers. We didn't have a ring doorbell. We didn't have internet. We didn't have cell phone that showed where they were. Um, we didn't have DNA. We might have had blood typing. And you're in there just kind of going at it. And I won't say it was better. I don't think it was better, but it was different. But now, there's so much technology out there. There's so much stuff to look at. There's so much stuff to question. Um, you know, if you're trying to get DNA in a case, there may be an 18-month backlog before you can even get the result. So some of it's good because I think fewer wrong convictions are happening. Um, you know, you can't go anywhere these days that you're not observed for better or worse. And that's not the government of Germany. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. I don't know how many people here have a ring doorbell or some sort of other video camera. Um, but, you know, we get a case now, a criminal case, almost all of them have some sort of video. People have cell phones. So anybody has a cell phone, you know, um, Google knows where you are right now. You know where I am, all right? That's all private information. That's not the government following you. That's industry following you. And so, you know, if somebody wants to know where you were, they get a warrant, and we get a warrant, and that happens in criminal cases all the time. We issue warrants for where we're, here are the records. Here's the e email. Here's the, I don't use Snapchat and Facebook and all that, but there's a ton of information in those things. Um, so it's helpful in the sense that we kind of know where somebody was, and we probably don't have the wrong person. It's kind of invasive. You know? And uh, we, also, we also deny warrants when we don't think a person has a right to go into your cell phone. Like, I don't think you've shown enough to look into this person's cell phone. I don't think you've shown enough to get three days of this person's activity, where the person was, here, there, and where. Um, so those are, again, new technology issues that we're dealing with. I would just, I'm a big believer in people having access to a court system. I think I said that like three or four times. 
Um, I'm a big advocate for the court system. I understand what people think of it some. I understand the jokes about it. I understand the frustration with it. Some of it's legitimate, you know. Um, but I think we need to hold on to it. I want people to believe in it. And I want people to be able to access it because it's one of the great creations of our system of government, our constitution. Um, you know, I say to jurors when they go back, we just had 12 people who never met each other, never met the judge, never met anybody involved in the case, who listened, or decided to be impartial, agreed to be impartial, listened to the law that I gave it to them, applied the law whether they agreed to it or not, and came to a decision. Other than you're there in a government building, there's no governmental involvement in that at all. We can't even ask you what you talked about. We don't want to know what you talked about. You can't tell us what you talked about. Imagine what a powerful system that is, and there's no government involvement in it at all. What other thing can you think of that is on? I mean, that we set up the system, but we put you in a room, and you say, you do what you think is right of the laws I give this to you. I don't know many other countries in the world that have such a system, and that's where you really do get to be, you know, with a jury of your peers and your fellow citizens. So I think it's a great thing. So that's what I would do if I had a magic wand. Um, what else I do, I don't know. When it comes to sentencing, yeah. how much leeway do you have in your decision making versus, you know, there must be some mandate for certain crimes or whatever? So that's a big question. Um, if it is not mandatory sentencing, I have a lot of leeway. Um, if it is mandatory sentencing, I don't have a lot of leeway, obviously. Um, so like first degree murder is mandatory life in prison. Second degree murder is life in prison with parole eligibility of somewhere, parole eligibility somewhere between 15 and 25 years. I get to set it. Mandatory sentencing does not enter into my sentencing directly that often. It enters into it indirectly very frequently by this mechanism. All right, the district attorney decides what charge to bring against someone. If you have a prior firearm or serious drug offense in your history and you're caught with a firearm again, you're an ACC-1, Armed Career Criminal 1. That's a mandatory three to five years in prison. ACC-2 becomes like five to 10. ACC-3 is like 10 to 15. That's where the plea negotiations come in. Right? If you're caught with a certain amount of drugs, based on the weight of the drugs and the class of the drugs, you're into mandatory sentence. In plea negotiations, the district attorney will say, I will drop the weight down. I will drop the armed career criminal enhancement one down if, you're, if the defendant will plead to X. So then the defendants can say, I can take two to three years, or I can take three to four years, or I can go to trial, where by force of law, I'm looking at eight. I'm well, mad, because the judge can't do anything about it. Um, so that's where the prosecutor has a pretty fair amount of power in how the prosecutor charges. Um, and that's where mandatory sentencing comes into effect. And that's one of those situations where you often see, you know, you com the complaint about um, minorities saying the system is unfair, right? Minorities get charged with those mandatory enhancements at a higher rate than non-minorities do. And so like, why are we getting charged? That's a charging decision. And I'm not talking about Joe Early's office or anybody in particular, I'm talking about large statistics, not just in Massachusetts, but statewide. So once you get that first step, you know, once you've been charged with one drug and one serious drug offense or one firearm offense, now you're already in jeopardy. You know, and that's where those charging decisions make a difference. I'm gonna charge you with a gun case, I'm not gonna charge you with a gun case. Um, and that's one of, when you hear about um, structural bias or structural racism, those are the kinds of things that we're trying to deal with in the system. It's very hard to tease out those statistics. Um, a lot of them happen before somebody comes before me. I've got a 20, 25, 35 year old person before me. I don't, I can understand his background or her background, but I didn't create it, I didn't make it, I can't change it. And I can't change the fact that you're here on your second arm robbery. There may be reasons you ended up in your first arm robbery. There may be reasons you're ending up here. So you're trying to be aware of it, um, but uh, most of the time, 
the mandatory sentencing ends up being broken down. So on the one hand, to a defendant who's actually done something bad, wrong, the defendant is maybe getting some sort of forgiveness or understanding or compassion or rationality, proportionality, because he's admitting and acknowledging and taking some part of here and some probation and a program. To the person who is actually not guilty and didn't do it, you may be compelling some pleas because they can't roll those dice. I've been held for two years. You want me to do three. If I go to trial and lose, I'm looking at eight. So what am I going to do? I'm, I'm going to plead because I don't want. I can't. I can't guarantee that I'll be found not guilty. So it's it's both a good thing and a bad thing, like many things. And I would say generally we try to deal with it pretty fairly. Um, but um, it 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 enters into the system sort of that way, not as directly as you might think. Because we don't have a lot of people who go to trial facing a mandatory sentence if they're convicted. They generally don't go to trial. How about the habitual drunk driver? So that's causing the, accidents, yeah, that's, that's, property damage, right. loss of life. So and we again, hear it on the news six yeah. times. Yes. So I'll say two things about that. First of all, we don't generally get those in Superior Court. Those are generally district court cases because they don't rise to the magnitude we do. The fourth and fifth offender who's run over somebody or killed somebody, we get those. That's also being indicted for vehicular homicide and generally manslaughter. So those cases, when they graduated, if you want to use that term, to that level, they come before us. Um, there's a lot of mandatory stuff about um, OUI drunk driving. I'm not doing it anymore. I never did a ton of it, so I don't remember it exactly, but you get a, what they call a 9024D disposition on your first offense. You lose the license for 45 days, you have to go to a program. On your second offense, I think you're required to go be incarcerated for at least 14 days. Usually it's at a facility for alcohol um, treatment. The judge can put you in for longer. That's a one or two year loss of license and you can apply for a hardship. It goes up from there. When you get to like the third offense, now you're looking at like a year. And if you refuse a breathalyzer, you get penalized pretty severely. If you've had like two and you refuse a breathalyzer, it's like an automatic, I'm throwing numbers on it, so don't quote me on this, but it's like a three or five year license loss for refusing the breathalyzer, all right? Not because you were found guilty, because the breathalyzer the, the license loss is not a criminal penalty. You don't have a constitutional right to a license, so it's not a criminal penalty. It's an ancillary condition, and the state has the right to limit your license. Wouldn't we be better when you take the license away for sure, 45 but, days sure. to also take the car away? Well, but that's, <laughs> so that's <laughs> confiscation. That's a big problem, right? But now we're taking your personal property without necessarily proof. We've had a big problem with um, confiscating stuff because there was a car involved in drugs. So say you have a relative. Say you have you know, a son or a grandson who's out, picks up his friends, and one of them has a backpack full of, not say full of, but they have some cocaine. We see these cases, they happen. Right, where people your age, my age, are like, I didn't know that they were whatever. Well, now we're taking the car. We're taking the car because it was used sell drugs. Like, well, I didn't know anything about that. Well, how do we know? you? Didn't? All we know is the car was used to sell drugs. And that becomes a long, expensive process for you to hire a lawyer to try to not have your car taken. All right? So you got to be kind of fair. Like, you want to be draconian on the people who are doing this. But you got to be careful they're doing it the right way. We have a lot of cases with younger people who, you know, somebody in the car, I mean, marijuana is now most illegal, but somebody in the car has cocaine in the backpack. Somebody in the car has a gun in the backpack. And there are four people in the car. Now the police will typically charge all of them with possession of a firearm. But it is perfectly conceivable that all I did was pick up Joe to give him a ride to Six Flags, and damn Joe had a gun in his backpack. I didn't know Joe, Joe had a gun in his backpack. So, you know, you've you got to look at each case individually, which is something I think the public doesn't always see. The other thing I'll say about the repeat offender they're driving illegally. Okay? <laughs> They're driving illegally. We give out, in 
Superior Court, we don't give out so much restraining orders. They're called 209A orders, all right, where it's domestic violence. Somebody hit me, I want him out of the house. Usually it's a him hitting a her, all right? That doesn't necessarily prevent it. It, it usually works, to be fair, okay? I had at least two domestic homicides where the restraining order is in effect against my client. But he's homicidal. <laughs> the paper's not going to stop him, but I don't know that he's homicidal. I've also had restraining order cases where they were clearly false. You go to court and you have evidence, he wasn't there. He couldn't have done that. He was in another state. So you have to be careful at what level and how quickly you restrict somebody's freedom or take away their property. That's why the system takes a while. That's why it's kind of slow. But we have to give people their rights. And the other thing I would say following up sort of on that in the mandatory sentencing is every case is different. Every case is different. They're not the same. And when you really wade into them, you find out that, that they're different. Everyone has its own facts and its own people. Um, so to say that they're a widget, that every operating under, there's an operating under, that every domestic violence is a domestic violence, that every robbery is a robbery, that every drug case is a drug case. They're just not. Um, so that's why mandatory sentencing, for me as a judge, in some ways, I think is not a really good idea. Let's that on the record. But I will follow the law, it's not my decision. It's the legislature's decision, and I'm not, we have separation of powers. You know, we have the executive and the judicial. Um, and the legislative, and I don't interfere with them, and they don't interfere with me, and the Constitution says we each have our own lane. So I will sentence in accordance with the law, because I took an oath to sentence in accordance with the law. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But, you know, again, the, the perfect is the enemy of the good. Anything else? All right, well, um, I'm very happy to, to uh, have the opportunity to talk to you. I hope um, some of what I said is helpful. Um, if I said the wrong thing, I want that erased. <laughs> I'll deny ever having been here. Um, but, um, you know, two things. I do want people to have access to the court system. I understand lawyers are expensive. Again, if I had a, my second Patrick Mohandas, I would, as part of the court system not being so expensive, I'd make it so lawyers weren't so expensive. Um, it is sometimes complicated stuff. And as I said, sometimes we don't really control it. And, you know, I was like a lawyer in private practice for a long time. I thought my rates were pretty good. I thought I was pretty reasonable about my billing. But I would have to explain to my clients sometimes, I don't control what happens. So I've had my house painted recently. I'm getting my driveway done. In a post-COVID world, I'll tell you that's really hard. I've been chasing driveway guys for like six months, <laughs> and I can't get them to show up or they promise me they're going to show up, or they don't, or they'll see me in October. I went to like three people I could find to paint my house, and they gave me different estimates. I had some guy fix my basement, and as soon as he got down in my basement, every other thing had to be fixed. So I feel with contractors like people feel with lawyers. <laughs> and, and the contractor that I hired, stop finding stuff. Like, just stop finding it. Like, my house didn't collapse before you came here. <laughs> you know, you're kind of fixing it, but... I just need this, so I get it. You know, it's a specialized field and you don't really know. But in the same way, my contractor did actually find some sagging beans in my basement that actually did need to be fixed. And then I actually hired a structural engineer to make sure that what he said was true, although I, I kind of trusted him, but I just wanted to make sure if I ever sell the house, I can say it's structurally sound. And then the engineer came in and he didn't want me to call a column a column. It's a beam and I can't call a beam or whatever because it's just something else. Like, this thing over here and that thing over there, are they okay? So I know what it's like. I understand what it's like for people to talk to lawyers. Um, you just got to use your kind of common sense and, and use your judgment about whether this is, you know, an honest, decent person, and and try to maybe just pay for this much initially. But it is true that you get involved in stuff that you can't control. Like if I say to my client, I think it'll cost this, and suddenly the Commonwealth decides to indict you for a second thing, I can't control that. I, I didn't do it. I wish it didn't happen. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's hard, um, but, you know, your best, your, we always say to jurors, use your common sense, life experience, and wisdom when you make a decision. Use the same thing when you're hiring a lawyer. If they sound like they're super expensive, you know, don't use them or get a couple of different bids, but um, most things, 
initially, certainly like paperwork, I don't think should cost a lot. Once you get into court, it's just kind of hard to manage. All right, so it's very nice to see everybody. Thank you very much. Uh, enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you very much.